Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Yang, and I'll be serving as the online chaplain this morning. I'll be with you in the chat, both on Zoom and on Facebook. If you're visiting or worshiping us for, with us for the first time today, welcome. We're eager to greet you and learn more about you. So stay tuned. There'll be more information about getting connected to St. Michael's a little later in the service. Our worship culminates in the celebration of the Holy Eucharist. If you're joining us from home, we encourage you to find something simple to eat and drink. And when it is time for communion, you can participate symbolically along with those who are in the sanctuary. Now, as we prepare ourselves for worship, pause, take a breath, and let yourself rest here in God's presence. Come, and let us worship God together. begin our service with the lighting of the wreath, uh, the advent wreath, and to, be, to lead us there is Anis Wise and Grace. Today we light two candles. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Let us pray. Come, O Holy One, as the water of life and refiner's fire. Strengthen us with courage for your work of justice, that in all the creation and among every people, your peace may be established and your joy abound. Through Jesus, our deliverer, amen. amen.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, you sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed your warning and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Lissa Schaub. Our first reading is from the prophet Isaiah. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The word of the Lord.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. 
But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. The Gospel of the Lord. There's only been one time in my life when I was scared of an animal predator. I was working at a summer camp back in my youth ministry days, a uh, camp up in the Catskills in the middle of nowhere, and uh, I had to walk from one end of the camp to the other. It was late at night, um, and this path I had to walk was maybe a bit too close to the woods for comfort. Uh, and as I was walking, I heard this rustling in the thicket that lined the path that kind of was between the, the pathway and the woods. Um, and I immediately regretted shining my flashlight into this thicket um, because staring back at me in the distance were several glowing sets of eyes. And I knew that coyotes were nearby, but I didn't know until that moment they came that close to camp. It is amazing what your mind will do when you think you're about to die. <laughs> my brain like went into overdrive, um, trying to calculate my chances of survival. Um, if they charge, like, can I outrun these things? Can I make it back to my dormitory in time? Uh, my brain scrambled to access any files it might have stored away about what I'm supposed to do when I'm confronted by a pack of coyotes when I'm armed with a flashlight, um, how to stay alive, how to survive. And I think it's really important to mention at this juncture that I have zero wilderness training and I have not an ounce of expertise in defending yourself against a pack of coyotes when you're armed with a flashlight. Now, obviously, since I'm standing here, the story turned out okay. It turns out they did not charge. They just watched very menacingly as I very quickly walked <laughs> back to my dorm. Uh, and I made it safe and sound. But that experience shifted something for me because it, it took um, predatory animals that I have like, loved to admire in pictures and in zoos, um, and it added a real fear of them. You know, I, let, I go to the zoo with my nephews and they're looking at these beautiful tigers and in the back of my mind I'm thinking, I really hope that barrier works. Because <laughs> I know how it, how it feels, you know, when <laughs> they're a little too close for comfort. And whenever I read this prophecy from Isaiah now, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, this vision of lions and tigers and bears, oh my, lying with their prey peacefully in harmony together, I think, uh-uh, like, no way. <laughs> there is no way this could be possible. 
As long as that lion remains a lion, as long as that coyote remains a coyote, there is no way I will ever feel safe. Even if God herself promises that that coyote is not going to attack. But if we sit with that vision for a moment, if we use a little bit of that Ignatian approach to scripture, putting ourselves in the story, just for a moment, imagine it. Imagine walking past a wolf lying peacefully next to a lamb. Picture a lion and an innocent calf, both next to you, neither being a threat. Try to imagine not feeling scared for yourself or for that lamb or that calf. And note that this vision for God's kingdom does not get rid of lions and tigers and bears, oh my. It changes them. In their beautifully created uniqueness, they are no longer predators, dangerous, threatening. Everyone's there. But the rough places have been made smooth. The valleys exalted. The mountains made low. The predator declawed and defanged. In this vision of God's kingdom, Isaiah tells us, they will not hurt or destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. Well, we are so far from that kingdom, aren't we? This earth really is lacking in the knowledge of the Lord, lacking in a rootedness in the God of sacrificial, selfless, unconditional love, abundant instead in selfishness, scarcity, and fear, overflowing with violence, mistrust, racism, anti-Semitism, sexism, depression, anxiety, illness, unemployment, grief. There is so much around and within us that is a far cry from God's reign of justice and peace. And that is why I love this season of Advent, where we live in hopeful expectation of the valleys being exalted and the mountains being made low and the uneven ground level and the rough places a plain where the cries coming out from the wilderness are making straight in the desert a highway for God. Because the landscape hasn't quite changed yet. The voices are still crying out in the wilderness, begging us to prepare the way of the Lord. I am thrilled we get to read about John the Baptist today. He is a biblical character I don't think we, we get enough time with. Um, and we don't get to dive into him deeply enough. I've always felt a kinship with John the Baptist. He's cranky, but focused. And just once, I would love to use the insult, you brood of vipers. <laughs> but the important thing about John is his role in preparing the way for Jesus. We need John the Baptist in Advent, the voice crying out from the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, the voice crying out from the wilderness of our own despair and grief and suffering, because the one thing we can't miss in Advent is that the good news of Jesus Christ does not start in the promised land. It starts in the wilderness. That might sound awful. Wilderness is not something that is usually considered a happy place. It's wild and overgrown. It has the connotation of being a place untouched by humanity. It's a place where there is no clear way through. In the Bible, wilderness functions as a place where nothing else is. It's a place in between. Wilderness is a place of uncertainty and danger and fear, a place where lions and tigers and bears lie in wait, a place we must conquer lest it conquer us. But another biblical connotation of the wilderness is a place where prophets sometimes went to be purified. So then, wilderness is not only a place of fear, a place of exile, excuse me, but it is also one of refuge, and even, perhaps, a holy place. The theologian Dolores Williams 
offers a helpful perspective on wilderness. In her book, Sisters in the Wilderness, she explores the white cultural impulse to civilize the wilderness. And she writes about wilderness from the perspective of the enslaved African. For them, she says, wilderness was a place where there was freedom. It was a place they could travel through to get to the north. She describes wilderness not as a place of fear, but a place ultimately of transformation. It was a place to escape the harshness of a cruel owner, a place you moved through to reach your freedom. In this perspective, wilderness can be a place to meet God, a place where a new road can be forged, a place where we find a better way forward. If we allow wilderness to be a place of despair, then any new landscape will look ugly and threatening. But if we allow wilderness to transform us, then perhaps we can live into the hope that one day we will not hurt or destroy each other, that the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord. In this season of Advent, we are preparing ourselves for the beginning of the Jesus story. But if we look to the end of it, to the vision that Jesus laid out for us for what God's kingdom would be, a place where the lion can lie down with the lamb, where peace and unity and equality reign, where the most vulnerable are finally safe. How can we carve out a road for Jesus to walk through this wilderness so that God can transform it? We've got a few more weeks of this season of Advent and this season of preparation. We're eager for Christmas to come, but maybe this year we can take our time in the wilderness. Maybe this year we can let God inspire in us the possibility of the lion and the lamb, the coyote and the human living peacefully together, changed in God's vision. Maybe this year we can resist the temptation to leave the wilderness before we are done with our transformation. Amen. Let us affirm what we believe in through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all sin and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Hello, St. Michael. My name is Annie May, and I'm here to lead you in the prayers of the people. When I say, Christ, be our light, 
please join me in responding, shine in our hearts. O oh God, who dwells in darkness and light, dwell in the hearts of your people in hope, peace, and joy. May we await with anticipation the coming of Christ, the morning star. Christ, be our light. O oh God, who framed the brightness of the first light in creation, dispel the arrogance, animosity, and anger that shatter the unity of your holy church. Fill your faithful people with the radiant light of truth. Christ, be our light. O oh God, who delivered your people from the misery of bondage in slavery to the land of promise, set us free from enslavement to division, disunity, and distrust in our public life and labor. Illumine those in authority with a light of vision. Christ, be our light. O oh God, who patterned the stars and called the sun and moon into being, pattern the hearts of people everywhere to see in each other the beauty of the universe and the splendor of creation, that divisions of race, class, gender, and ethnicity may be recreated into one common humanity. Christ, be our light. O oh God, who showers comfort and hope to the lowest, the lost, and the least, shower the light of compassion on the sick, the sorrowful, and the suffering. We pray for Raquel, Rachel and family, Donna and family, Jeff, Jasmine, Elizabeth, James and Millie, Grace and Daryl. Help us to be your compassion and hope in the world. Christ, be our light. O oh God, who welcomes those who have died into the brilliant light of eternity, welcome those whose lives have been cut short by violence, sickness, and strife. We pray especially for Deacon Lawrence Schacht, Maria Ortiz, and Michael Mastroianni. Shine the light of hope. Christ, be our light. O oh God, who delights in the complexity and splendor of creation, help us to delight in the diversity of this earth, our island home. Inspire your people to care for all that you have made. Christ, be our light. Who knows no setting. Find us ever burning with light of love, the spirit of truth, and the wellspring of hope. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your goodness in each other, in ourselves and in the world you have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done, and the evil done on our behalf. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we may abide in your love and serve only your will Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. 
May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Having uh, today and next Sunday, we'll be hearing from members of our congregation about ways that they give and serve. So today, John Avery is going to speak to us about his outreach here. Good morning. Uh, everywhere you look in this church, you're going to be seeing volunteers. We have volunteers up here in the chancel this morning. There were volunteers greeting you as you came in the door, singing in the choir who prepared the altar, uh, presenting hospitality. Uh, volunteers everywhere, and some very important volunteers have a special impact outside the church on our neighbors. These are the volunteers who sustain uh, St. Michael's outreach programs, such as Saturday Kitchen and Homework Help. When uh, we say during the liturgy that Christ is risen, we deliberately use the present tense. 
right now, right in this moment, in a never-ending present, Christ is with us. Often in forms that we don't even perhaps see, but there anyway, always with us. Certainly, he's on the line of people who we feed, the very long line who we feed on Saturday mornings. He's in the midst of the busy volunteers who uh, are prepping the food and packing the bags. He's there with the people who are stirring the pots in the kitchen. Uh, we've been doing Saturday Kitchen now for over three decades because Christ calls and calls and he rewards with quiet joy those who respond. And with that joy, I'm convinced we change the world. Now, maybe we create only as much change as is created by the beating of butterfly wings, but it's changed nonetheless because someone is there who rewards us for service with joy. Back in the first days of the pandemic, we actually shut down the Saturday kitchen uh, for a week because we hadn't figured out our new system. Uh, we were just kind of blindsided by this and so it shut down. And that first Saturday morning, uh, I stood at the gate to tell people who were coming for food that day uh, that there was none. We couldn't help them. Their disappointment was palpable. You could feel it. Some of those people were clearly showing up expecting the only food that they would have that day. And we had to turn them away. And it was heart-wrenching. But the next week, we were back in business, and soon we were feeding more people than ever. Now we feed over twice as many people as we fed before the pandemic. We transformed our operation. We transformed our core of volunteers. We had too much important work to do to let the, par uh, the pandemic paralyze us. We're a band of friends on Saturday morning. We're a community who discovers meaning in helping the community around us on a weekly basis. If you're interested in Saturday Kitchen, in being part of this meaningful work, uh, please uh, talk to me, talk to Ned Boyajan or Chris Ishibashi or someone else who you know who might be involved in the program. Um, I believe Jesus was pretty clear. He says to us, just look and you will see me. Sometimes uh, I know I number among those who don't see him all the time and everywhere, but we have that opportunity and we can do that in, in St. Michael's out, outreach. And uh, there's no time like now. Thank you. And now walk in love as Christ loved us. An offering and sacrifice for us all.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. Because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death, and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great triumph to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice in be to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophet, and above all in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. For in these last days you sent Jesus to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In Christ you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In Christ, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take it. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember Christ's death, we proclaim Christ's resurrection, we await Christ's coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Savior of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and the blood of his new covenant. Unite us in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through whom and with whom we accept you, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit in the fullness of time. Put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with Mary the God-bearer, St. Joseph, St. Michael, St. Jude, and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your children through Jesus Christ, our Savior, the firstborn of all creation, the herd of the church, and the author of our salvation. By Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. As our Savior Christ has told us, we now pray. 
Beloved, these are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most gracious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for announcements. Good morning. Let's try that again. Come on. Good morning. Okay, here we go. Wonderful. So it is with glory, the second Sunday of Advent, this season of much anticipation and expectation. One of the things that we were anticipating and expecting was the opportunity to elect a new bishop for this diocese, and that happened yesterday at the electing convention. The Reverend Matthew Hyde, who is, has been the rector of Heavenly Rest right across the park from us, has been elected to be our new bishop diocesan. Bishop Coadjutor for a stretch until Bishop Dietschy retires. So please pray for Matt and his family as they step into this new role. Um, and thanks to our delegates who were there and part of that yesterday for John Avery and for Gail Robinson and Anna Laughlin, as well as the clergy who spent our day there. No. Those were our delegates, right? And Carol was there as alternate, I guess, yes. All who were there, plenty of people were there. Um, on Tuesday, we will be um, celebrating the life of and uh, blessing Lawrence Schacht, who was a retired deacon here in our midst and a beloved parishioner, longtime member. Um, so we failed to get that in the Friday email that comes out, but it will be sent in an email today to make sure we get that information out. But this Tuesday afternoon at 4 o'clock, if you are able, please come and celebrate Lawrence's life here together in church. I know that we've got a couple announcements about things that are coming up. A lot of announcements. It's that season, obviously. So, um, Lucy, let's start with you because you're going to tell us about things that are upcoming that we need to know about. Good morning, St. Michael's. My name is Lucy Culver. And uh, as you know, we have a wonderful uh, offering of uh, events during the Advent season to help us prepare for Christmas, and I'm here to tell you about two of them and to help you sign up for them. The first, <laughs> you knew that was coming, right, if I'm up here. Um, the, the first um, is, a, if you're not familiar, if you're new to St. Michael's, is a wonderful uh, uh, tradition that we do to help support our neighborhood here in New York City. It's our St. Nicholas gift drive. And we have 35 children on our list this year who are either participate in um, uh, the Saint uh, in the Trinity Lutheran um, after school program here on 100th Street, or in our own homework help program. And these are children who honestly probably won't get uh, a nice Christmas, and so we're here to help them give that. The children range in age from 2 to 14, and you can sign up for one or you can sign up for as many as you want. All of the details are on the online site. This is in Looking Ahead, and uh, you'll get a confirmation email with all of the directions, how to do it, how it works. It's not hard. You can certainly ask anyone. Um, all of the gifts will be due here on Friday, December the 16th by um, 5 o'clock. In addition, these families, we are going to provide them with grocery gift cards, so you can also contribute to that as you are able. You would give to St. Michael's as you normally do, and you put in that memo uh, grocery gift card. And so that's how we are, again, helping to support our neighborhood this season. The second, which I'm so excited about because it's just been too quiet for too long, is our annual Christmas brunch. Two weeks from today, on December the 18th, it's back. We haven't had, had been able to have it because of all oh, these dreaded germs, but it's back. And it will be after the 10 a.m. pageants, lessons, and carol service. It'll be in the reception hall. And it's a wonderful time for all of us to get to come together and just 
have some Christmas cheer during the season of Advent. That said, what do we need to make this happen? Volunteers. So we need folks to bring food, beverages. We need people to set up, decorate, clean up, serve food. You know the drill. Uh, again, this link is in looking ahead. You can click on it. It takes two seconds to sign up for what you might be able to do for us. And also to help uh, facilitate these online signups, I am going to be during coffee hour, sort of in the back, um, with my wonderful husband, Ridge, my daughter, Lily. They're here. They're uh, acolytes today. And we've got our trusty iPad. I've got my laptop. We've got our mobile phones. We can help you sign, sign up for both our Christmas brunch and the St. Nicholas uh, toy drive and be happy to answer any questions that you might have for either. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lucy. Um, Linda, why don't you come on up and tell us about something else. And while you're on your way up, I'll just make a quick reminder that if you don't get our email um, and you are wondering where you find all this information online, go to the QR codes on the back of your bulletin, and that will take you to where you need to go to find out more. Linda, what else is coming this week? Well. <laughs> I saw three ships come sailing in on Christmas Day in the morning. And that's an ancient carol, and this is a penny whistle. And uh, the Christmas ship will be sailing in to St. Michael's this Thursday, December 8th, 7 p.m. in the hall. At, um, and tickets are at the door. My name is Linda Russell, and I have presented an early American Christmas here for at least 40 years. <laughs> Takes my breath away. Except, yeah. <laughs> Except for the last two very dark years. But the light is back, the ship is sailing, and we'll be back. So I'm thrilled about that. Um, please join us for hammered and mountain dulcimers, fiddle, cello, harp, flute, and bagpipes with carols and dance tunes and drinking songs <laughs> because it's 18th century New York Christmas and that's what they did. And um, we'd love to have you join the magic. I will have cards about it in the back um, as you leave today. Thank you. And now working our way back in time, the middle schoolers are going to come and tell us what's happening right after this service at the back of the church. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Thomas. So at the back of the church, separate to the other activities going on, there will be a celebration of the Jollies, and there will be some Australian biscuits, I think. Um, and I don't know if there will be any beverages, but it's going to be good fun. So please come and join us. Uh, and at the same time, there's going to be a bake sale to support uh, Saturday Kitchen, and donations are wanted, and enjoy the treats. So thank you. Great. There will also be um, some beautiful crafts, which if you received your communion back there, I realized we were having you sort of shop as you came for communion, but there are some beautiful crafts from Uganda that will be um, laid out, and those um, are made by, and therefore the proceeds go back to, um, an organization from Uganda that was founded by Michael Miro, who worshiped here with us now five years ago, but continues to stay in touch um, with us and our congregation. So with things to, uh, to shop for Christmas. As Thomas said, there's a farewell for Peter and Margaret Jolly, and in order to properly say farewell to people, we need to bring them up forward and pray over them. So Peter and Margaret, are you here in this space right now? Where are they? There. Come on forward. There they are. Come on, 
There you go. Come on up. I'm stuck here because of the microphone. So come on up so that people can see you. Turn around and let them admire you. So Peter and Margaret blasted into our congregation a few short years ago and changed everything and won our hearts. And it is a great sadness to have them now return to Australia and to the life that they had there in the Sydney area. And we want to thank them and bless them for all the amazing work that they did in this community while they were here and just send them on their way with our love and our blessings. So if we can put our hands out for blessing for them, we're going to say these words of that traditional Irish, bless Irish blessing. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face. The rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Amen. Amen. We know you'll come back soon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have one quick announcement. Um, today is Kate Flexer's birthday. Uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kate. <laughs> Happy birthday, Kate. You're a wonderful woman. You're a wonderful priest. You're a wonderful mother, and we appreciate you. Thank you. You're a blessing to us. Thank you. The Somni announcement tells you that this is a vibrant church. Things are happening everywhere. And so be part of the movement. Be part of the congregation. And now may them, you stand for the blessing. Yeah. <laughs> may the sun of righteousness shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
peace to love and to serve the Lord.